Admission. My name is Robert Tremblay. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions here at the school. And what we're going to be focusing on today is really we're going to be starting a series called the Physiology of Taste. And so over the next five weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be diving into how human beings actually interpret food and how they go about tasting food. Um, and when we look at the physiology of taste, we're focusing on the five tastes that the human tongue can receive. And there's only five of them. They're salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Okay. Outside of those five tastes, when we talk about flavor, we're talking about the introduction of our sense of smell. So it's a very important thing to start to think about when you're coming into becoming a chef or a bacon and pastry chef in terms of thinking about ingredients and understanding flavors as they're different from taste because taste is what we receive on our tongue and flavor is the incorporation of those five tastes with the sense of smell and the aromas that come out of food when we're eating them. So today what we're going to be starting off with is the salty taste. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna dive into salt. We're gonna talk a little bit about its characteristics, some various forms of it, as well as its usages and the different ways that we can go about using it not only in the kitchen, but in other areas of things and really just get an understanding of how human beings interact with salt, which is quite honestly, one of the most important and versatile ingredients that exists in the world. Um, when we talk about the amount of salt that's available to us in terms of the, the ocean, um, the amount of salt that's in our oceans, if you dehydrated, took away all the water, the amount of salt that would be remaining would cover the entire planet by about 500 feet, which is kind of incredible to think about. Um, but that's the amount of salt that we have going around our planet. And that's why it's such a crucial part of what we use because we use it in just about everything that we cook, whether it's on the sweet side or the savory side. We use salt in just about everything, not only as a flavor enhancer, but also as a preservative. It's a really important part of preserving foods, and it's really one of the main reasons that humans are in existence. Without salt, humans would not have been able to survive because, as obviously, we up until about 50, 60 years ago, refrigeration really wasn't a readily available thing for humans in, this, in, in the world. So using salt was a way to preserve ingredients and get more out of what they had on hand. Um, and so when we look at the different variations of salt, as I mentioned, you can use it in the cooking element, but then you can also use it in the preservation element. So those two areas are very important. Um, we also utilize salt in a finishing capacity. So over here on my right, I have some examples of some different finishing salts. So not just using it in the cooking process to pull out moisture, to enhance flavors, but we also finish foods with salt that have a lot of different characteristics. Um, you can see there's kind of a myriad of different colors over here, um, but I'll talk you through just a few of them. So here in my hand, this white salt is called fleur de sel, which is a French salt that actually is created through evaporation of sea salt. Um, it's one of the most coveted salts and the most expensive salts in the world um, because it literally is referred to as the king's salt um, and it's actual translation is flower salt. Um, so what it basically is, is through salt basins, when they take seawater and evaporate it, they basically take off that top layer of salt that comes through that evaporation. So it's a very um, intricate salt, has a lot of moisture to it, so it tends to clump, um, but it's a very highly sought after salt and uh, really a great thing to finish dishes with table side. It's a very common practice to use that in. Um, here in the front, I actually have some pink river salt. It's called Murray River Salt, and this actually comes from Australia. Um, I don't know how well you can see on the camera shot of the pink hue that's coming through, um, but this is actually developed through carotene, which comes out of the algae that grows in the river, um, and it actually is the same element that turns flamingos pink, uh, which I know sounds a little bit strange, but sh uh, the shrimp and the, and the algae that um, flamingos actually eat is what helps turn their um, their feathers pink because they actually start off as white birds. The same thing with the salt. Once it, once it dehydrates, it turns um, white, but then through the algae that's available in those riverbeds um, is actually what turns it that beautiful pink color. So it's a kind of cool element. Our next two salts, these are actually both from Hawaii. So the one here in front is a black lava salt. Uh, which is a sea salt as well. So this goes through the dehydration process, um, but it has charcoal elements as a result of lava. Um, and then here in the same instance, we actually have a red um, sea salt that also comes from Hawaii. This actually comes from the clay sediment. It also has a big impact from the volcanic activity and the lava, but you can see from the different terroir that these salts are coming from, really has an impact on the coloration and the flavors. So all four of these different salts are really utilized in a finishing capacity. So in a lot of restaurants, they'll serve them um, table side to really give a nice enhancing flavor um, to whatever they're working with on hand. 
Um, in the kitchen, as chefs, what we utilize the most in terms of a cooking salt is going to be uh, kosher salt. Um, kosher salt is really just a desirable element because it's purified, so it really has a really nice um, characteristics in terms of its crystallization size, has a really good ability to coat foods and work in that capacity, um, but it's just really a preferred salt in terms of uh, working in the industry. You will find kitchens and restaurants that do use um, iodized table salt in their cooking. Um, the problem with using that is it can sometimes have adverse effects on the flavor elements of things, um, can turn them bitter. Um, in fact, iodized salt was brought about in the 1950s as a way to help with thyroid conditions. Um, people weren't getting enough nutrition to help balance their thyroid, so the iodized salt was introduced into the daily diet here in the United States and around the world. So. With iodized salt, you can definitely use it for a table salt, but in terms of cooking, you want to stay to a, a classic kosher salt is probably going to be your best bet. So um, with kind of that introduction, what I want to get into next is what we're going to be doing with salt today um, in terms of the way that we interact with it and using it as a preservation device. Um, I want to show you that method through the making of fresh sauerkraut, homemade sauerkraut, um, which is literally a combination of two ingredients, literally just fresh cabbage, and salt. So it's about understanding your ratio, um, but the way that we're going about building sauerkraut is through the fermentation process. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of fermentation before. It's how we, we get things like beer and wine and things of that nature, but that fermentation process is done through adding yeast to grapes or to grains, um, and that yeast is utilized to break down the enzymes and the carbohydrates that are found in either the fruit or the grains, and it turns them into alcohol. In this process, through the fermentation of the cabbage and the use of the salt, it's actually what it's going to pull out is a is the bacteria called lactose bacillus. So we're doing a process here called lacto-fermentation. And through that, the salt is actually going to pull out that bacteria, which is actually a good bacteria, um, and it's going to break down our, the carbohydrates that are in the cabbage and actually turn it into that sour um, salty, delicious concoction that we taste. Um, if you've ever had sauerkraut on a hot dog at a baseball game or anything like that, it's really that same process of fermentation. Um, so what I'm going to talk you through is the process to prepare it um, and give you a little bit of facts about the fermentation process as we work through it. But the amazing element of this is the fact that we're creating a food from literally two ingredients, just the use of, of, of kosher salt and the fresh cabbage. So um, over on my left, I've already got some cabbage prepped up ahead of time. In total, we're going to do about three pounds of cabbage to about one ounce of kosher salt. Um, but what I've done so far is I've halved and quartered our um, our our cabbage here and I've taken out the core already and so all you're looking to do is is cut your cabbage into really thin slices. Um, you can use a mandolin if you want to that's probably the best way to do it to get consistency but as young chefs you want to really work on your knife cuts so it's very important thing to uh, to get into this and use the the skill sets and really kind of practice the motion of it. So as you can see I'm using my fingers as a guide as a barrier to not only protect myself and hold the cabbage but I'm also using it as a guide to measure my cuts. So you really want to try to make your cabbage cuts as thin as possible. So this is a great technique to use to really work on those knife cuts and understand your knife control. Okay, so we're just going to finish that off. And so if you have some, some thicker pieces, that's okay. You can put those into the mix. They're going to break down just as well as the thin ones. They may just take a little bit longer, um, but really it's about of just trying to get them as thin as possible when you're cutting them by hand. So just going to get our cutting board cleaned off here a little bit. Okay. Put all that into the bowl. Now we're going to sanitize our board again. Very important element when we're talking about fermentation is making sure that we maintain sanitation at all times because any type of bacteria that will get into this, any type of germs and things like that can really throw off not only the fermentation process and make it unsafe, but can also add, have adverse effects on the flavor, which is also very important. So maintaining cleanliness at all times is very crucial. So we've got everything prepped out and ready to go. I'm gonna put on a couple of gloves here to begin the next step in the process. And that's going to be salting the cabbage. Okay. It's always very difficult to put on gloves after you get your hands wet, but you get them in there, no problem. Okay. And so like I said before, we've got about three pounds of cabbage here, so we're going to need about an ounce of salt to properly 
utilize this in our dish. Um, but really your ratio is going to be whatever the weight of your cabbage is by grams or ounces, you want to do 2% the weight of that in salt. So whatever your ounce total or your gram total in terms of weighing out your cabbages ahead of time, uh, once it's cut that is because you're going to cut a lot of pieces off so you never want to weigh it whole. Weigh it as this is and then 2% of that is what you want your weight to be in salt. So three pounds of cabbage kind of translates to about one ounce of, of salt. So we're just going to sprinkle that in all over our cabbage. We want to sprinkle it around really all the places but once you see what I get into in the next second um, you'll see that it really kind of doesn't matter. You can kind of just dump it into one place if you want to because what we got to do now is work in the salt. And so we're going to massage the salt into our cabbage. And so this is going to do a couple of things. First and foremost, it's going to start to pull moisture out of the cabbage, which is going to allow us to really kind of reduce the size of it. And more importantly, it's going to start to pull out that natural bacteria, that lactose bacillus that I was mentioning before. Um, so what this is ultimately going to start to produce for us is a brine, which um, is sometimes used to make pickles and, and other elements of things like that, but it's really just a salt and water solution when we talk about a brine. Um, it's a way to, to flavor things as well as preserve them. So that brine is crucial because oxygen is kind of the death of fermentation in a lot of ways. It causes spoilage. Um, anytime that you have something fermenting, you want to make sure that you keep um, as much oxygen off of it as possible um, so that way it doesn't start to spoil. You do need some, you do need a little bit of oxygen to help it breathe um, because the gases that form from the fermentation process can be somewhat combustible. Um, some of the, the batches that I'm going to introduce you to in just a bit that I've done earlier this week, um, I've actually had to, to burp them, which you know, sounds a little bit silly, but you want to make sure that you release those gases periodically because they can actually burst on you and cause kind of a big mess. So you really want to make sure that you kind of treat it like a living creature because when we talk about bacteria, it's actually a living growing thing. Um, and one key element and interesting note is that lactose bacillus, I know that we've heard of lactose for people that are lactose intolerant, um, is typically something you associate with milk and dairy products. Um, in fact, the same bacteria that we are pulling out of this cabbage um, is the same bacteria that they use to make things like yogurt. Um, so something that is not only a fermentation and a preservative, but really it adds a nice tangy flavor to things and uh, really generates a lot of uh, interesting dishes that you can make with it. Um, but this technique of lacto-fermentation is really one of the safest and easiest methods to really introduce yourselves to fermentation, um, just because of the, simplic the simplistic nature of it. Literally every type of vegetable and fruit is going to carry that type of bacteria. So you can do the same type of method with a number of different things. Um, but the thing you want to try to utilize is the traditional um, ingredients because that's always going to give you the best results in terms of flavor. You can always do the science, but sometimes there's certain things that you want to keep regular because they just taste a heck of a lot better than getting something that's really weird and intricate. So Peyton, if you want to zoom in here, I'm going to show you the moisture that's starting to develop on this cabbage. You can start to see it squishing up a little bit. We're starting to get some residual moisture down in the bottom of our bowl. It's exactly what we're looking for. We're building that brine so that way once we put this into our our mason jar it's going to have a brine to sit in and it's going to keep that moisture or keep the um, the cabbage away from the oxygen that's going to cause it to spoil and turn bad and it's going to generate that fermentation process. Okay. So we've got that worked in really nicely. I'm going to remove these gloves for just a second as I prep our station. Okay. Put on another set of gloves. And so I'm going to use this uh, half hotel pan here. Really it's just a basin to catch any of the the cabbage that kind of goes awry as we try to put it into our mason jar. Now they do sell funnels and contraptions and things to help people um, jar their, their cabbage and, and go through the canning process, but um, I just used a little bit of parchment paper, a little ingenuity, never hurt anybody, so a little bit simpler process to be able to, uh, to get our cabbage into our, our mason jar. Okay. Okay. It's a nice little way to keep things clean and tidy and 
not have to go out and buy silly contraptions that you're only going to use once or twice in the kitchen. One thing you always want to avoid is buying things that only have one purpose in the kitchen. So very important part of the process is just to not waste your money on simple things like that. Okay. So we're going to take out our funnel really quick and we're going to pack down our cabbage. I'm just using a small ladle. So what we're doing here is not only making more room for the rest of the cabbage, but we're also squeezing out more of that brine. So we're just going to pack that down nice and tight. And we're going to get our funnel back in and continue to fill. So what we're making here is really going to end up equating to about a quart or so of actual cabbage, okay? Or a quart of actual sauerkraut. So this should only take between three to 10 days to actually ferment. So it'll be a very quick process for you um, to get through this process and really allow you to, um, you know, really generate a, a, a sauerkraut and a fermentation process in a very short amount of time. Okay. Continue to pack that down. Okay. Perfect. Going to set this off to the side, and clean up our station a little bit. Okay. You can see how much we've got packed in here. Now this is going to generate that brine, as I said, you're gonna to start to see that moisture come up the side. And then very important step here is what you wanna do is you wanna make sure you cover it. You can use just saran wrap, but we're gonna give a little homage to the old school way of doing this. And we're actually gonna cover it with some, some fresh cabbage. So I'm gonna put that into place down in our jar. And so this is gonna help us keep the moisture off of it as well. We're gonna to continue to pack this down. Okay. Exactly what we're looking for. So I'm going to set this off to the side. Now, this is a batch that I did yesterday. And so you can see um, what we're going to do next is we're going to add a weight to this to keep it weighed down as I have it kind of set up here. Um, inside is just a, a simple glass jar that I've wrapped in some plastic wrap and put salt in it to help weigh it down. Thought it was kind of a good pairing to to put us put some type of salt to weigh it down inside but that weight is going to help compress the cabbage overnight and allow it to um, generate more of that brine and have it come down and compact it even more help bring out some more of that liquid um, an important thing to keep in mind is that as i said before to burp it to release those gases after about 24 hours you're going to start to see um, some bubbles start to work up in this and that's really the fermentation process it's going to happen relatively quickly so you want to make sure that you um, release it and peyton if you want to come in and show kind of the sides here how we have those bubbles coming up the side um, that's that fermentation process that's the actual breaking down of those carbohydrates of those sugars and actually turning them into the fermentation process and generating that beautifully sour smell that's already starting to come out of it so most important thing is the temperature that you hold this at you want to make sure to keep it um, really somewhere between 50 degrees and 70 degrees. You don't want to go too much higher than that, and you definitely don't want to go too much lower than that. If you go too high, your product is actually going to start to rot and turn bad very quickly. Um, if you do it too cold, you're going to kill the fermentation process. That bacteria needs kind of that perfect um, temperature zone to be able to grow properly. So really the best place to keep it is in a, in a cold, dark basement. Um, so anywhere between 50 to 60 degrees is probably going to be your sweet spot. Um, but if you don't have a basement, you can keep it in a closet. That's actually where I've been storing it here to do the fermentation process. So it's really about maintaining it and checking on it. So over those first 24 hours, you want to continue to press this down um, to continue to release that brine. So I'm going to get this sealed up real quick just so that we can continue on. But what I want to show you next is where we've kind of gone with the process. So as I said, this one I started yesterday. And then this batch I actually did on Monday. So this is 
three days in, in the solution. Um, the brine, you can see the difference, how here you have really kind of the outline of the cabbage, and here you can see that it's starting to, con to continue to break down. Um, I'm probably gonna let this go for just about another day or so in the fermentation process before I remove the cabbage, and then I can just put it in the refrigerator and it'll last for months. You can really store this for six months, um, really up to a year if you if you want to. But uh, most people that are willing to make their own sauerkraut are probably going to eat it well before that time comes up. So really, an important thing is to to make sure that you let it carry through that fermentation process before you get it into the refrigerator. And you want to continue to taste it, continue to smell it, treat it like a child treat it like you love it because it's really a living breathing thing and you really want to make sure um, that it's staying consistent and then the last thing I want to show you is what we're going to use today to finish our dish that we're going to make this is some of my home batch that I made um, back in August back when I was still quarantining and um, away from people this was why I got into this was really the the, uh, the downtime of, of quarantine. Um, and so this was a batch that I made um, several weeks ago. I actually let this go for 14 days in the fermentation process just because I wanted to see how it would turn out. And I like it, you know, overly soury and, you know, really kind of pungent. Um, so I was able to, you know, produce that. And now we're going to have a lot to get us through the winter, which is exciting. So um, what we're going to do with this is we're going to make a very classic German bratwurst. So in another homage to um, to kind of the old country in terms of um, the dish that we're going to make um, and, a, and a nod to Oktoberfest if anyone's ever been to an Oktoberfest before. Um, really an awesome experience to um, really experience culture and, and really some amazing food. So uh, we've got our sauerkraut ready to go. Um, over here on the right in our pot I've got some fresh bratwurst that I boiled off and are just holding um, at a kind of a gentle simmer for us. Um, so we're going to prep our sauerkraut and actually build our, um, our bratwursts. So we're going to get our ingredients over here. Gonna get our pan going, okay? And this is gonna be a really simple process to really kind of re, you know, reconstitute our sauerkraut and bring it to life. Very rarely are you going to serve sauerkraut cold. Um, it's not really the most appealing thing when it's served cold. Um, best bet is to heat it in a frying pan. Um, if you really need to, you can microwave it, but that's a little sacrilegious if you ask me. Um, but we're just gonna let, bring it to life a little bit. We're gonna use some whole unsalted butter, um, some minced red onion, and then we're gonna top it with some bacon because why not use another product that's made pretty much primarily from salt through the curing process. Um, just a nice little addition. So instead of topping it with um, like celery salt or something traditional like that, we're going to top it with bacon and use that kind of like our, our seasoning for the, end, for the end of our dish. So just going to get our whole butter into our pan. Now, using whole unsalted butter, and the reason for that is we want to make sure that we control our seasoning from start to finish. As a chef, one of the most important things when working with foods is to control that seasoning. As much as we talk about the power of salt in terms of the, the benefits it can give you, using too much salt can be, the ju can be just the opposite effect in that regard. So you really want to make sure that you're in control of it and you manage it from start to finish. Okay? So we've got our butter ready to go. We're going to add in our onions. Okay? Going to add a sprinkle of kosher salt here just to season them up a little bit. But there's going to be plenty of flavor going into this once we add in our sauerkraut. Now, the butter adds two elements to this. Now, it's not only going to um, allow us to sweat and cook down our onions, but it's also going to bring a round edge to um, the acidity and the sourness of our sauerkraut. That fat component is really a balancing element. The salt and the fat are going to go really well together. That acidity is going to help cut through the fattiness of our pork um, and veal bratwurst that, you know, are sauces, so they definitely are lined with a lot of fat in them. So having the sourness and the roundness of our, um, of our toppings and our, our aromatics is really going to bring a nice balance to everything that we're putting together. So our onions have cooked really quickly. When you mince them to the size, it should only take about 30 seconds or so for them to start to come through. So we're just going to put a couple scoops of our beautiful sauerkraut in here. Smells amazing. And sprinkle a little bit of the bacon in here just to get it started. Save the rest for the topping of our 
bratwursts. I'm gonna put a little bit of pepper in here. Now the one difference that I have with this batch that I made in August versus the way that I prepared it today um, and previously this week is I actually added caraway seeds, which is a traditional flavor enhancer that you can add to it. So it's completely optional if you want to. So I wanted to do the next batch with just salt to see a taste comparison um, between the caraway seeds and see how much of a huge impact that it had just because I'm a food geek and that's what I like to do with my spare time. So our sauerkraut is looking great. I'm gonna give it a quick taste here. I'm gonna kill our heat. Perfect, absolutely fantastic. So happy I made that. <laughs> Perfect. So we're going to put on some gloves for our plating. So very important thing at CIA that we talk about, as I mentioned, with our sanitation with regards to the preparation of our, our sauerkraut. Plating is a big part of an understanding of food safety as well. Um, anytime you're working with ready to eat food, you want to make sure that you put on gloves so that you're not compromising the food in any capacity and you're always putting your customer first and keeping them safe. So we've got our, our rolls ready to go. I'm going to retrieve our bratwurst. Perfect. Perfect. That ready to go. Now we're going to take our beautiful sauerkraut, bacon, and red onion mixture. And we're going to top glory in the world right there. If you can't enjoy fall with this combination of flavors, I don't know. I don't know how to help. <laughs> Perfect. So we're going to finish this with the rest of our bacon bits that we made beforehand. Add a little bit of a crunch, a little saltiness more, and smokiness as well. Can't ever have too much bacon as far as I'm concerned. And then we're going to plate it with a little bit of horseradish mustard to finish it off. And there you have it. Beautiful homemade sauerkraut with bratwurst. Enjoy.